And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. We're back with our mental and emotional health series. Today, I'm here with a great wrestler. We go back a long way, Kyle Ferris. Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Gene. Absolutely. All right, so let's let's jump right into it. Let's let's talk about your story. Talk about your wrestling career and then college, just how everything went down and, you know, your mindset and everything where you're at today. Okay. Well, uh, you know, let me uh, let me start off. I uh, I wrestled at Somerville High School. You know, I, I grew up in a family of wrestlers and uh, the town of Somerville. Obviously, we had a great midget program. Um, a lot of great coaches. You know, middle school program was was solid. So. Uh, naturally, everything I've absorbed in my life has been wrestling or wrestling oriented. So um, big wrestling background. Um, I, you know, at Somerville High School, I was a uh, three-time county champ, uh, two-time district champ, three-time region finalist, um, you know, three-time state qualifier. Uh, went ahead, career took me into, you know, into college where I wrestled at East Stroudsburg University. Um, place that I had went to for wrestling camp for a long time started going there for wrestling camp I think fourth grade was the, the the first time I had went there for wrestling camp and just fell you know fell in love with it fell in love with the university um you know just the the location uh you know how close it was to where I grew up and everything you know it, it seemed like a, a very good fit even at a young age I loved the coach that was up there you know coach Borzio I don't know if you remember him or not but you know, big guy looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's how I'll, I'll always remember. You know, the first time I saw him, he was this uh, this larger than life guy. Um, so, he, you know, at a young age, I I kind of knew that's where I wanted to go to school. That's where I wanted to wrestle. Um, you know, it was Division One. Loved everything about it. So, uh, you know, I I graduated high school in two thousand and four. Um, you would have been what you were oh uh, oh three or oh two. I was oh two. Oh two. Okay. Yeah. I think we, we were what on Team New Jersey. I think once or twice oh, yeah. together. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, right, glory days. I have the jacket in my in my um closet. Oh, you, me too. Did you get the Strasburg T-shirt? Um, I still have a. I still have some ESU gear. Believe it or not, <laughs> I uh, I was lucky enough to 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 maintain some of the old gear. Um, so, the, church, yeah. the intensive camp. Oh yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, I wish I still had all of my t-shirts that went back. I have a trunk. I have a cedar trunk filled with nothing but wrestling t-shirts. You know, um, if you know anybody I can donate them to, let me know, you know, they're just sitting in a cedar chest. I'm sure there's tons of kids that maybe could get some use out of them. Um, you know, a lot more than I'm doing with them. So, <laughs> but, um, so you know, back to it, 2004, you know, I graduated high school, went ahead, went up to East Strasburg University. Um, and, you know, right away, dude, I was, I was loving what college life was about as far as, you know, being a college athlete. Okay. You know, the, the, the wrestling, you know, just the workout routine, um, you know, starting early in the morning, you know, preseason workouts, you're, you know, you're up at 4.30 to, to be on the, the, the football field, which was always the funniest thing. You're on the football field at, at 5 a.m., you know, to do sprints up the up the bleachers and stuff or do buddy carries around the track. Um, so, you know, started out there 2005, 04, 05 was my freshman year up there. Um, and right away, you know, like I said, I was loving it. Things were going good for me. Um, wrestling was my main focus. I wish I could say, you know, that was my only focus, but you know, wrestling that, that, that was my, my major focus. Um, at the end of my freshman year of college, I had, uh, you know, I'd ended up in a relationship, uh, you know, sort of, you know, sort of dating, sort of not, uh, dating, you know, a, a certain somebody and, uh, you know, it was something that didn't quite work out but it did. So we were, you know, we were kind of off over the summertime. We did whatever, you know, kind of lived each other's lives. Um, at the start of my sophomore year, which I was extremely excited for, you know, uh, waiting for big things with wrestling, you know, it's coming in wrestling 141. Um, very excited for it. The start of the sophomore year, we reconnected. 
Um, and we, you know, started going out, you know, officially we had an official relationship. Um, prior to us going out over the summertime, um, you know, she unfortunately, she had lost her mother. Um, her mother had been uh, terminally ill with cancer. And, um, you know, it, it was a, a very tough thing for her to have to go through at, you know, at, at such a young age. Um, you know, I was uh, uh, 20 at the time. She was, uh, you know, two years older than I was. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a very, very tough thing for her to have to go through at a young age. You know, I, I can't even imagine having lost a parent at that young of an age. Um, she had, unfortunately, um, to, I guess, kind of deal with things. Um, she acquired all of her mother's leftover pain prescriptions. Um, naturally being around her, being around them, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, found myself uh, giving into the, the, the temptation of, uh, you know, prescription, you know, prescription medications, opiates, you know, stuff you're, you're not supposed to be using, you know, unless you're injured, you know, unless you have an actual reason from a doctor to use them, right? So uh, through the course of my sophomore year, um, you know, I found myself not going to class all the time. I found my, my academics really suffering. Um, you know, I was constantly spending time with her, uh, which isn't, you know, which isn't a bad thing, you know, but I found myself spending all of my time with her, you know, if it wasn't wrestling or if it wasn't, re um, you know, if it wasn't wrestling or, <sighs> yeah, if it wasn't wrestling or an extracurricular activity, let's say, um, you know, my, my, my time was, was always with her. Um, so as that year progressed, as that sophomore year progressed, um, I found out that I had become ineligible for wrestling, which for me was, you know, shot in the heart because here's this thing that I worked so hard my entire life. Um, I mean, I know you can attest to that, you know, when, when you're all in on wrestling, you're all, you know, your whole life, I mean, you're all in, you know, you live, breathe, eat everything wrestling, you know, your whole life is devoted to it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's truly a way of life. We have a very, very unique sport. You know, I, I think uh, any wrestler will tell you we're a different breed, um, different mindset, you know, as, as you obviously know, completely different mindset. Um, so to have lost that, it, it was very tough, you know, growing up, dude, I, I was very straight edge, man. I, I, I didn't drink in high school. I didn't party. I didn't do anything. You know, um, I was very, uh, I, I had very strong morals as far as knowing that I need to stay on the straight and narrow to, you know, to accomplish my goals. Well, unfortunately, sometimes yeah, you and you had the flashiest socks in the state when you yeah, wrestled. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Blue monkey sock. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I got to, I had to throw that in. Go ahead. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was very tough losing that. So, um, you know, as the end of that sophomore year progressed, um, you know, I found myself, you know, kind of falling into this deep, uh, deep depression, so to say, um, you know, I just wasn't myself. Um, I know my roommates recognized it sort of from the fact that like, well, they, they were never seeing me. Here's these guys that I wrestled with, you know, and they spent all this time with me in the wrestling room. And then outside of it, um, I was kind of constantly sleeping over my girlfriend's house. You know, um, I was, uh, you know, I, I was, I was infatuated with her and certain aspects of the relationship. We had a very toxic relationship with, uh, you know, which definitely impacted, you know, my life and her life. Um, wasn't a healthy relationship by any means, but, you know, we were both hurting at, at that point. You know, we were both, uh, you know, definitely in, in, in tough spots. Um, so as that, like I said, as that, that year was coming to a close, finding out that now for that upcoming year, I'm ineligible, I can't wrestle, you know, uh, and now it's all kind of, you know, as those days were coming to a close, man, I mean, it was really like weighing on me heavy. Like, I'm going to have to tell my parents, 
I'm going to have to tell my friends, my roommates, like, yeah, my coach knew, but it was also, we had an outgoing coach of uh, Angelo Borzio. And then we had an incoming coach of uh, coach Kutz from uh, Lehigh. So here's this guy that was coming over. I got to work out with them once or twice. And I was so excited for this because here's this new coach, a lightweight kind of guy, my, you know, a, a scrappier style, you know, he's coming from Lehigh and everything. It was like, it was kind of a big deal to get that to happen. Um, so I was, I was really excited about that. But then at that same time, it's like, yeah, no, you're, you're not going to get to experience this. You know, I had no clue what was going to happen. Um, so it was all, you know, it was all kind of really coming to a head that summer. Um, that summer we were, we were off and on fighting all the time. Um, but still there were certain aspects of the relationship that were keeping us both in it. Um, stuff I wish I, I had more strength to overcome, but unfortunately, sometimes there's, uh, there's things that will get the best of you, you know? Um, and I, and I can attest to that fully, you know, and, and very quickly things can spiral out of control. You know, you think you can be in control and, uh, no, no, no matter how hard you try, no matter, uh, what you do, these things can, can overpower you, you know, and, and take control. Um, come back into school after that summer, September 3rd, 2006. Um, it was a Sunday night. Uh, girlfriend and I had officially broken up. That was it. Had a huge blow up fight. And, uh, you know, in a complete irrational moment, um, complete moment of weakness and, and, um, you know, like I said, feeling lost and just not knowing what to do. I went ahead and took a bottle of Tylenol and you may think, oh, Tylenol. Well, you know, what's that going to do? Well, when you take a, a, a very large bottle of Tylenol and, and consume the entire bottle, um, it very quickly will, will affect your body, will affect your, your kidneys. Um, I left my apartment after consuming that bottle went down, sat in my car. Um, I had the intentions of, you know, leaving and just driving until I passed out. It was very late. So, you know, there weren't really going to be any cars on the road. Uh, once again, that's that irrational thinking, not thinking about anybody else, but my pain at the time, you know, wasn't thinking about all the pain, what could possibly happen, what was going to happen from my actions, thinking about my pain in a moment of weakness. It was very, um, I was very selfish in that moment. And I hate to use that for this particular instance, but when I look back at it now, it was a very selfish thing I was doing. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to do anything for myself, but cause pain for many, many other people. But I went ahead. I did what I did. Um, I sat in my car, passed out, unfortunately. Um, or I shouldn't say, you know, unfortunately, but I, you know, I passed out, right. Uh, you know, the, the, the girlfriend who's now the ex-girlfriend, um, you know, found me in my car unconscious, uh, had broken the window, pulled me out of the car, um, called an ambulance, you know, police ambulance show up. Um, prior to that happening, she had, uh, you know, in, uh, I'm sure a, uh, just a moment of complete panic um, felt that she needed to try and help me, you know, get the Tylenol out of my system. Um, so she had stuck her, her fingers down my throat to help get me to bring up the, the, you know, Tylenol help, help make me vomit it up. Uh, in doing so I had aspirated vomit into my lungs, um, which later would be a, a very big, uh, you know, very big part in, in me becoming seriously ill. Um, ambulance had came, they picked me up, they brought me to the nearest hospital, which was two minutes away, Pocono Medical Center, right next to East Stroudsburg University. Um, in getting there, uh, right away, they pumped my stomach. Um, they had to induce me into a coma because of the uh, toxic level of Tylenol that I ingested into my system. Um, in about 48 to 72 hours, all of my vitals had greatly diminished, had dropped. Um, all of my organs were 
were starting to to fail, um, all because what had happened was when I aspirated the vomit into the lungs, that later became a pneumonia. So in a few days, that became what was called an aspirated pneumonia. Um, hospital was never aware that that had happened, that that was in my lungs, you know, that that, that, that vomit was in my lungs. Um, a, you know, like I said, 72 hours, I went from 155 pound division one wrestler, healthiest you can, you can imagine, um, to full multi-organ failure in a few weeks time, you know, say a week's time, maybe, um, liver kidneys completely shut down. Uh, they were, uh, putting me on, uh, you know, intubated me. Uh, I was on a, uh, a ventilator, um, I had been induced into a coma. So now here it is, you know, a week and a half, two weeks go by. Um, when my liver and kidneys had shut down, my body started retaining all of its fluid. I went from 155 pounds gene up to 240 pounds. You know, I think any wrestling coach would be extremely pissed having a wrestler be that much overweight, you know, <laughs> that, that's a big jump. I've never, I've never seen that number before. Um, even my brother was a little, you know, a little jealous. I got that heavy. Um, <laughs> but I, I blew up to 240 pounds. Um, at that point, everything had shut down. I was being put on dialysis uh, to help circulate, um, you know, my blood. I was on dialysis three days a week. Um, I had ended up having what was called a compartment surgery, which was they opened me up from my pelvis to my sternum uh, and had to leave me wide open for a few weeks to allow me just to, to kind of drain and, and, uh, you know, um, you know, kind of allow my organs to, to, you know, allow them to, to not swell, but to, you know, uh, allow the pressure, the, the relief of the pressure. Uh, cause as you can imagine, I wasn't a big guy. So going up to 240 pounds, that was, uh, you know, it was quite a bit of stress for my body. Um, you know, all the while, while this is happening, you know, I'm on a ventilator, you know, it's nothing more than that ventilator inflating my lungs, deflating my lungs, keeping me alive at this point, you know, I'm barely hanging on. Um, September 21st or 22nd, um, because my condition was so grave, they went ahead and they had to life flight me from Pocono Medical, uh, Pocono Medical Center to Hershey Medical Center. They needed to get me into a bigger trauma unit. Um, when they got me there, they immediately had to do emergency surgery on my stomach because I had infections setting in and there was just, uh, you know, there was uh, some missteps at the hospital with how the procedure was done. Um, surgery, the emergency surgery was very successful and everything. Uh, they stabilized me and I actually, I started, uh, you know, I started making some, some progress. I was able to come out of the coma. Um, a few weeks later, it was, uh, I wanna say the second week it was like October 13th or 14th, somewhere in there. I was actually getting ready to be discharged. Uh, you know, I, I made really good progress. I had a tracheotomy at the time. They were able to close that, take it out. Um, I was going to get transferred to JFK rehab facility. Great news. Day I'm supposed to be transferred. The transfer unit was late coming to visit, you know, coming to get me. At that time, uh, my nurse came in to give me the last of my meds, um, at which point I was double dosed on potassium, um, which sent me into multiple grand mal seizures, at which point um, I, you know, flatlined multiple times. Um, and I was once again now back into a coma, retraked again, bedside, they had to do it. Um, and then for about two weeks, I was, uh, I was listed as brain dead. You know, I had next to no brain activity whatsoever. Uh, I couldn't get any stimulus going, anything like that. Um, and they were very heavily trying to, you know, convince my parents to go ahead and take me off life support that, you know, there really wasn't any hope at this point for me that they should just let, uh, just let nature take its course, you know, kind of a, a hard pill to swallow for any parent, um, you know, and, and New Jersey wrestling mothers are not people to mess with, you know, I don't care who you are, that, that, that's uh, probably the worst mother, you know, you, you can try and, uh, you know, tell what to do. So um, thankfully my mother, um, you know, my father too, but my mother was, 
you know, is my angel, my guardian angel in that hospital, not allowing anybody to, to give up on me. Um, so unfortunately, um, you know, after that, you know, things, uh, you know, things did get better down the line, but, um, I ended up having to have partial amputations done to my hands and feet. Um, I had lost circulation to them while I was in the coma. Um, so I had the front half of each foot amputated. Um, and then the fingers on my right hand, all pretty much taken almost all the way to the, you know, all the way to the hand itself. You know, I lost, still have functionality with it, can still write with it, you know, when you're, uh, you know, when you're putting in tough situations, sometimes, you know, we like to adapt and find a way to, uh, you know, get through them, get over them, um, you know, put a hurdle in front of me, I'll get over it somehow, you know, climb it, whatever, I'll get over it. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a tough thing when I finally got out of the hospital, I was in a physical rehab facility for a few months, um, but, you know, ended up getting out of it. Um, the, the whole time it, it was, it was tough learning bits and pieces of what had happened and, and trying to make sense of everything that I did that night. But, you know, it, 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 it wasn't anything I, uh, you know, it wasn't anything that I, 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 uh, I wasn't going to be able to, in my mind, I wasn't going to be able to get over, you know, like I very quickly was able to look at it and just be like, wow, what, you know, what, what did you do? And, and right away, you know, like as a wrestler, right. And, and you know, this, you wrestle somebody, you have it taped, right. Let's say you win, you lose, right. Whatever, maybe, you know, you win, wasn't the best win you ever had, or you, you lose this is a guy who's in your, your weight class. So you're going to see him again. What do you do? You go back and, and you study the tape. Well, I didn't have a tape to study, but I certainly had, um, you know, I had thoughts about what I had done and it was very easy for me to look very closely and very quickly, um, at what my actions had, had caused, you know, to happen. Um, it was a lot of strain on my family, as you can imagine, you know, my, my parents, my brothers on three separate occasions were planning my funeral. Um, I mean, right down to the point where they were, you know, deciding who, who were going to be the pallbearers, who was going to be where, you know, they contacted the funeral home. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, dude, it was really bad. It wasn't, you know, there, there's no easy way to say it. There's no what light way to talk about it. It was, you know, uh, dude, I was, I was really, really close to being gone. Uh, there was a rumor at a, I shouldn't say a rumor, but it was announced at a Friday night football game at Somerville high school that, you know, I had passed away, you know? So you had people at a football game that were, you know, in tears and stuff like that, thinking that I had passed away because it was, you know, my condition was so grim. It's just like, oh yeah, he's, you know, he, he's gone, you know? Um, so it, what my family had to go through. It's like, I know what I went through physically through it. Right. I can remember my thoughts at the, in the hospital and stuff, but what my family had to go through, man, I, I can't even imagine it. You know, I can't imagine it. And that's why it's like, I, I say, I had pain that I was experiencing at that time. Right. I had a lot of mental and emotional pain I was going through. You know, as I said, in the beginning, I lost you know, I, I lost wrestling, which meant so much to me, even though, and it's like, I can look back at it now and I know, okay, yeah, you were ineligible, but you, that's a hole you can get yourself out of, you know, that's not, oh, you're permanently ineligible. That's just, okay. You're in, you're ineligible for the upcoming season. Wasn't thinking rationally about it. You know, I was just so upset to have lost it. Then you mix in the fact that there was, you know, some drug use, you know, and, Gene, I want you to know, it's like, it wasn't drug use where it was every day. You know, I wasn't, I'm, I wasn't Tony Montana sitting at a desk with a mountain of things in front of me. You know, it was, you know, very, I don't want to say seldom, right. But it was like, all right, maybe this weekend I did it or, you know, the, the following weekend or, you know, it, so it wasn't everyday use, but unfortunately with the opiates, man, it doesn't take a lot. You know, they're, they're chemically engineered to alter you know, basically everything about your brain chemistry, you know, uh, they, they, they make you numb to so many aspects. And then when you actually 
start to experience feelings, they're, they're so, they're, they're so intensified, you know? So it's like what normally wouldn't be a big deal to you all of a sudden becomes a big deal. You know, what is a small problem? What is a, a molehill to get over becomes a mountain when you're on, when you're on opiates, dude, you know, um, I just had it, so as I said before, I had, I had had the amputations, right? Over the years, I've, I've, I've uh, recovered very, very well. I was able to get around for a long time. I was able to walk. Uh, my doctors, uh, you know, who initially didn't think I would be able to walk again because I had such weight loss. Um, I went from 155 to 240 through all the comas, all the, the atrophy and everything. I got down as low as 90 pounds. I mean, I, was, I was looked like a skeleton, okay? Um, it took me quite a while to physically really recover to a point where I was getting around and, um, you know, I was able to, to drive again and, and everything like that. But, you know, I, day by day was, you know, allowing myself to get better and better. Um, I wasn't super critical of my progress. I, um, there were definitely points in time where maybe I was a little tough on myself, but I was realistic with my, um, you know, with what I expected, what I, what I thought I could do. As I went on over the years now, um, it definitely, uh, you know, things definitely started wearing on me as far as pain, my feet. I experienced a lot of pain with my feet. Uh, they were not meant to be walked on in the shape that they were in, okay? Um, not left with many options, uh, I, I basically have just looked at what's going on around me, what's available, you know, what, what's available for people who are in worse off situations than even I was in. Um, and two weeks ago now, um, I went ahead and I had uh, double blow knee amputations. Okay. So this is something that I had to go through now, which it's, uh, it's more painful right now, you know, I mean, I'm still recovering, but I'm, I'm definitely, uh, at far exceeded where, you know, even my doctor thought I would be in recovery right now. Um, but to give myself a better, a better life a more pain-free life, I've decided that, you know, obviously the, and with doctors, obviously a lot of doctors input, this was the best choice for me. You know, there's a lot of prosthetics available for, uh, for people with, uh, you know, double knee, you know, below knee amputation. So, um, you know, even now I'm still feeling the effects from this, you know, I was always going to feel it, but you know, even now I've still had to overcome what I did, you know, all those years ago now, you know, uh, the biggest things that I can take from it. And I just wish if I could go back for a moment in time and just grab myself and, and, and tell me, you know, something it would, uh, it would just be to ask for help, man. It's so, you know, it seems so hard. Um, and for me, I mean, I, I know why I wasn't asking for help. And it's just, dude, I'm just a stubborn person. I always have been, you know, I'm Irish and Italian. I don't think you can get more stubborn, you know, than that. Um, probably one of the things that kept me alive, my body and my mind were just too stubborn to quit. Um, but, you know, I, I just wish, you know, because like the night that this happened, you know, that night, my roommates weren't around. I got up to school earlier than everybody. So I didn't really have anybody even that night that I could just sit and talk with, you know, to try and defuse the situation, you know, to, to try and, uh, you know, rein me back in, you know, from, from this, you know, far out thinking that I was, in, you know, I was experiencing at that time. You know, I, I never was depressed. I was never experienced any sort of, of mental you know, uh, I don't want to say a mental breakdown, but you know, that that's almost what it was, dude, at that moment, you know, I never experienced anything like that before. I wish so much that night I could have just grabbed myself and been like, dude, go, go talk to, you know, go talk to leaf, you know, go talk to Jordan, you know, go talk, go talk to surfer Joe, go, go talk to any one of your, your friends or roommates, you know, cause that little thing right there, just asking, you know, for one of them to, you know, to help me would have made a difference that night, you know, 
if any one of them could have just been like, dude, you know how much this is going to hurt us and how much this is going to hurt your mom or dad, that right there would have, would have shocked my, my system probably, you know, hearing that. Cause at that moment, like I said, I wasn't thinking about anything else other than my pain, my pain when, you know, ending my temporary pain was causing lifelong pain for everybody around me, you know? Your family's over, always there for you. And to do something like that to them, man, it, it's, you know, that's, that's really, that, that's, that's it. Like, that's the one thing you just have to try and sear into people's, you know, minds is w- the, what you're going to do is not helping anybody. You're only hurting people, you know, you're not even helping yourself because <laughs> look what happened with me, you know, <laughs> it's like, I'm always going to remember this mistake. You know, I will never, ever forget it. I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned a lot about, um, you know, life through this. I'm married. I have the most amazing wife in the world and I probably never would have met her if I didn't go through all of this. So part of me is just like, you know what, even if I had to, to go through it again for her alone, bro, I'd go through it again, you know? I mean, most amazing person I've ever met, stronger than I am. You know, I've been told, oh, dude, you're so strong. Nah, listen, there's tons of people I've met still. There's still people I meet where they've overcome bigger, bigger hurdles than I have. You know, it's just uh, it, life, man, you got to take it one day at a time. One, one hurdle, one problem at a time. We're all going to experience, you know, tough times. And you just have to have the strength to ask for help, you know, because that it's hard to ask for help sometimes, you know, it really is. Absolutely. What should, what should the friends and the family be looking for um, that if, if the person isn't asking for help, what are maybe signs that, that we could do? Because we all like to be more aware, right? Like yeah. A lot of people probably say, I'd love to help. I, I just didn't know. Yeah, um, I, I would definitely say, you know, closing off of relationships, you know, like when you just start to see less and less of people um, or your interactions with them become very short, you know, or if uh, uh, irritable, like all the time, like I, like I can tell you that, man, like I was very irritable with like my family when I would see my parents and stuff like that. You know, I, my dad, dude, he took me to every tournament that I wanted to on the weekends. You know, we had a very strong relationship and I was definitely, uh, you know, the time before this happened, you know, those months leading up, I was definitely not, not myself towards them. You know, I, I, that's one thing that I can think back to like some certain times. And it's just, you know, the, the way I was acting towards him was completely out of the ordinary. Now, do I think any one of those people recognized it? No, because I had never had any, I had never had any uh, history of stuff like this before, you know, Um, so I think now talking about it more and letting people know, like, look, these are just some of the signs that something may be going on because it's, it's not something that, you know, it, there, there's, there's, there's younger people nowadays trying to commit suicide or committing suicide at younger ages. You know, when you're seeing adolescent children committing suicide, you know, when you have high school kids committing suicide, um, you know, I, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, Gene, ever hearing about this stuff happening, you know, as frequently as it happens now. Um, so there's definitely got to be, you know, it, it, we definitely have to kind of stand back and look at it that, you know, all right, well, maybe things that we wouldn't consider have been a, you know, a telltale sign of it, or, you know, eh, he seems a little, you know, he seems a little off. I think, we, we have to be able now to, to recognize that, that some of these things where, ah, oh, yeah, you know, he's just, he's just irritable, you know, or, oh, he's just an a-hole, something like that, you know, oh, that's just his person. No, sometimes that's not just a person's personality or something, you know, sometimes they're just going through, through tough things, you know. Um, I know, growing up, man, I, I mean, I used to, to talk to anybody and everybody, You know, like I remember watching my parents, like they could bump into somebody in the supermarket who they don't know and strike up a conversation with them, you know, and walk away from a conversation with a smile. I think nowadays, especially with the 
with the pandemic going on and everything um, and lockdowns and everything like that, obviously we're, we're not being able to interact. And that's really tough on, on people's mental states because one of our ways of, of releasing stress and tension and, and you know, stuff like that is, is just through conversation, just through interacting with people. Um, I talk about, you know, how my, my mom or dad could bump into somebody, right? And I never used to hear the word stranger, right? I don't know. Th this was something I was thinking about. I never used to hear the word stranger. It was just like, oh, it's just somebody I don't know. And now people use the word stranger. And there's almost that, like, that stronger meaning of, of stranger where, like, oh, they, they could be a bad person, you know? Like, yeah, I get, I get there's a lot of bad people out there, but, you know, if, if you're, if you're struggling to, to ask for help, if you're struggling, right, mentally with, with something, you have to talk to somebody, right? Some people, they don't want to talk to a doctor. I get it. Okay. Talk to a stranger. And I'm not even joking. Talk to an older person who has more experience in life. Like I've always looked at it and the way. I was raised was kind of like, you know, you always respected older people. You're, you always respect your elders. Why? Well, because they have a whole more, you know, a whole lot more life experience than you do. They've probably done things that you're, you may never experience in life or, you know, that they've raised a family or that, you know, well, sometimes if you just sit down and ask a person for help, they're going to give it to you. There's still a lot of people out there who, who could sit and, and talk with you and maybe give you input or, you know, uh, explain something from a different point of view that you've never thought of it. You know, um, I, I truly think there's simple things that we could do to, to better like the mental state of, of just, you know, our communities and stuff like that. You know, I don't think there has to be all these, you know, I, I don't think you need a whole bunch of drugs and, and, you know, and stuff like that, I think it can be done just via, like really just with more interaction and, and, you know, kinder conversations between people, you know, especially for younger kids, man, they're, they're dealing with stress and stuff like that, that we never, we never had to experience, you know? So if you give them simple solutions, I think that's the best, the best thing right now to, to at least at least to, to lower, you know, lower the level a little bit, you know, I think levels are going up on, on these, on these rates, you know, let's, let's try and bring them down or, or at least slow the rates, you know, That's I it. don't know. And I know your story is going to be helping a lot of other people. I've no doubt there's a big reason why you're still here, why God kept you here. And yes, you sir. got a lot of work. I think, I think it's, I think it's only begun for you. I think you're going to touch a lot of lives and this, this video being a good, um, a start or a piece of the puzzle to help get the word out there and how important it is to ask for help, how important it is to talk to people. Really yeah. great. Yeah. Now it's, uh, I'm still here for a reason, Gene. And, and, um, if I can, if I can help one person, help one family avoid going through what my family had to go through, it's all, it's all worth it. I've talked with everybody in my family and they say, dude, go for it. You know, that's, I just want to help anybody that, that, that needs it, you know? This is, you know, I made my mistake. So let me help somebody avoid the same mistake. That's it. And I know you will. There's no doubt in my mind. Thank you very much, Kyle, for being so open about everything. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me, Gene. It, uh, it means a lot to me, dude. Absolutely. All right. Take care. You too, bud. Bye.